So today uh, I would be talking about this particular book, which is quite obviously a very daunting but a very engaging read because the information which is packed in these roughly 450 pages, I think you can stop and dwell on a single page and think about it for hours and hours and debate about those issues for a very long period of time. The reason is not that it's uh, absolutely and utterly convincing. If you read up on uh, Harari and evaluation of his works, you will find out that a lot of critical uh, commentary is available. And many seasoned historians and experts on a wide variety of subjects have disagreed with it. So that is a critique which has emerged from the West itself or from Europe itself. Now when we begin to ponder on a book of this sort, we can identify very quickly that the problem is with the paradigm. And of course it's the case with much of uh, philosophy which is coming from the Western world. Because they begin with this premise that a human being is simply uh, matter. Or you can understand a human being uh, simply by utilizing science. Since they already reject the premise, and in this book he also rejects the premise uh, regarding the fact that human beings, of, of course we consider it a fact, that human beings also comprise of uh, a soul. They also have a soul. But he calls it a myth. He says that it's a very enduring myth, but nevertheless it is a myth. So when you dismantle that, and the method that you have adopted is science, and you look only at scientific evidence. And another important dimension which is subjective, that is when that is sidelined, then of course we, you are left with a very neat narrative. Well, this was uh, an initial critical comment which also can serve as my disclaimer that I do not agree with much that is presented in this book. And for that, we have another forum which is called, which we have recently initiated called Critical Discourse Circle, in which we discuss and debate these issues, but that is mainly for teachers of our university. So uh, we intend to publish uh, the findings of CDC or Critical Discourse Circle, and through those ideas, you can engage with the book and see how we critically analyze these ideas. Now since this forum is uh, about the introduction to the book, and I've at least given this book three readings over a period of, let's say, five, six months. The last reading that I gave it is in the previous two weeks, and I have eight pages of notes for this session, but of course I'm going to skip a lot and would try to wind up in another 25 minutes because I've already consumed 5 minutes. Now as far as this book is concerned, you can see the title is uh, Homo Deus or we can even call it Homo Deus. It's the same word that uh, in Hindi or our language or Urdu we call Deo or Devta and then a brief history of tomorrow. The reason it's called brief history of tomorrow, one fact is that the, the author, he did his PhD in history from Oxford and his area of research was military history. But then he kind of diverted from that path because he had the propensity to look at the whole world uh, and his uh, advisors, they were against the idea. They wanted him to dig deep into a specific area. That is what you do in PhD. But then he again and again uh, moved away from that and he had that propensity to look at the whole world. And finally, that is something which he's been doing. His initial uh, work, which was also a best-selling or initial kind of popular work was uh, Sapiens. We also did a program on that. And later on I went on and I read this book and I thought that probably it's also very interesting. 
I find this book uh, more interesting than the previous one because it engages with the ideas that are relevant and also it talks about future. So based on this and along the way I'll explain why he has named it A Brief History of Tomorrow. As far as the sections are concerned, there is a very long introduction at the beginning which is called The, human, uh, the New Human Agenda. That's the first part and it goes up to 83 pages. That's the first part. And in this, what he says uh, is that human beings, in the previous hundreds of years, they have dealt with problems of famine, problems of plague, and problems of war. So he gives evidence how famines have uh, brought havoc to many different societies of the world in the previous centuries, and how plague has devastated societies, plagues like Black Death, and others, and of course germs, how they spread. And the third problem that he talks about is war. And then he goes on to say that as far as famine is concerned, if you look at uh, the blurb, so he quite provocatively writes something of this kind that you are most likely to commit suicide than be killed in conflict. Now he says this based on statistics. And he's of the opinion that you are more likely to commit suicide as compared to the chances of being killed in a conflict. So he says that from 1945 onwards, hum humanity or human beings or homo sapiens, they have steadily and progressively, they've got rid of war. So that doesn't mean that they've got rid of war completely, but he says that you, if you look at international history, you will realize that uh, we did not have a major conflict. And he keeps on saying that, well, I talk about it, all this from a European perspective, and if you live in another part of the world, there is this possibility that a different sort of picture emerge, emerges. Similarly, he talks about plague and viruses and spread of plague and our ability to come to antibiotics and to other means. He similarly talks about war, I've already mentioned. And then he says that since history does not tolerate a vacuum, so since we've got rid of these problems, so something has to replace these issues or these problems. So that's how he carries the story forward. And then he moves on and in this very interesting and intriguing discussion, he gives title to a section which is called The Last Days of Death. So then he talks about it, and again provocatively, I think probably here or elsewhere, it's not on the blurb, but he says that, well, death now is simply a technical problem. And sooner or later, we are going to overcome death. And by that, he, say, he says that we would become immortal, not immortal. So he says, for instance, if you bomb someone, he will definitely die. But, but as far as diseases are concerned, or somebody dying because of heart attack, or because of kidney malfunction, or because of malfunction of other organs, chances are very strong, and we are heading in the right direction, that you would replace that heart with a bionic heart, or with a bionic kidney, you would replace blood, and things like that. And later on, that's... Uh, how he proceeds and he says that we are moving towards becoming human gods or in Sani Deota Meham Jahai or transform Karenge because we'll have half of our body would be organic and half of it would be inorganic because we would have synthetic organs in our body. So he discusses it. And the best part of the book that I like the most is the way he the way he peppers the book with uh, interesting information because he widely reads. Yesterday, Mr. Usman is here, he has come all the way from Faisalabad, he is an electrical engineering uh, engineer himself. Yesterday, he shared a very long article which was published in New Yorker on 10th of February uh, this month on Harari, and that's the most comprehensive information I got about him. Uh, which this uh, New Yorker is a famous magazine which is published on him. So from that I got to know about it that he listens to a lot of audiobooks. So even while he's swimming, he's listening to an audiobook with a special kind of headphone which fixes onto your temples, not on your ears. 
and through vibration he communicates that voice. Anyway, so here he mentions this project of Google, which uh, is attempting to overcome the problem of death. And Ray Kurzweil is the head of this project, which is called Teleco, mm -hmm. and which was established in 2012 at Google. And the purpose is this, <coughs> that they wish to understand death and how can we delay it and how can we ensure that people continue to live. For instance, this director of Google Ventures is quoted. His name is Bill, Bill Maris Malis. And he says that is it, if somebody puts this question to me, is it possible to live over 500? The answer is, of course, yes. So they are engaged in genetic engineering, regenerative medicine, and nanotechnology. And with the help of them, they are trying to overcome death. So this is the very first section, which is called the New Human Agenda. And I think right now I should also share uh, a couple of comments about the popularity of this book and its writing style. It's highly accessible. And he says that in that interview which I, or profile that I read in the New Yorker, he says that whenever there is a simpler word available, I never go for a difficult word. So this is also, uh, I think, a piece of advice for those of us who write in any language. He says that whenever there is a popular, easier word available, I go for it. I don't go for any difficult expressions. And when you read the book, you will find that, yes, that's true. And partly that is uh, that explains the popular appeal of the book. Another comment is that he, as I've already stated, he gives lots of examples. So he would explain everything with the help of an example. He would not explain anything in a simple, dry manner of argumentation. Rather, he would give a lot of examples. So for instance, within this first section of the book, which is called The New Human Agenda, he talks about, and then after death, he moves on to happiness. Why is he talking about death and happiness? The reason is that these are two of the most enduring human issues or problems. For thousands of years, this is here inside our head that death is a problem and that all of us need to be happy. So he discusses both these issues. And then he cites, for example, this something which was initiated by probably Scandinavian countries that instead of only focusing on gross domestic product or GDP, they also started calculating happiness, which was called gross national happiness. So they started calculating happiness as well. It's mentioned on page 37. And from there he moves on and he philosophizes and he says, well, what is happiness? And then he explains that, well, happiness is not just about, it's not something external. Rather, it is a set of sensations that we feel inside us. And then he moves on and he says, well, it is, in fact, biochemical. So he explains a football match uh, where supporters are supporting their team and the players move towards the goal and finally they score a goal. So what happens? He says that our body or internal mechanisms, they are simply unaware of what football is. So certain chemical things happen inside our body. So these are biochemical events which happen inside us and that is how we feel happiness. Now, in this very interesting part, he goes on to say that, well, look at drugs. For instance, he says that that is also a biochemical pursuit of happiness. So if you take certain drugs, you will feel euphoric. You will feel very happy. So he says that what if the system is rigged? And what if certain medicines are designed in, uh, and they work in such a way that those sensations are created within you and unlike drugs, they don't have any side effects. So what if you take a daily dose of that happiness pill and then you will feel happy for another 48 hours and then you take another pill and while you go on uh, dealing with the challenges of your real world. So he raises a lots, of, a lots of questions. It's not that he is giving answers. Of course, he is building his argument on the basis of a premise, but then he raises these very interesting questions. And then he moves on and he says, within the same section, he talks about it and he says that, well, human beings, that unlike that omnipotent biblical God or omnipotent Islamic God, he says, 
the word that I have used here, des or deus, some of the ordinary Pakistani accent with deus we get it there, say. So the idea is that like those Greek gods, if you've read those, uh, if you've read Greek mythology and those stories uh, which are called myths now, so there are characters like Hercules, which is half man, half god, and he, he, when he begins to run, he is also flying and things of that sort. So he says that these attributes, which were tradi traditionally attributed, uh, these qualities which were traditionally attributed to these gods, now human beings within twenty first century, they will be having those qualities. And then he talks about cyborg engineering and being a cyborg doctor. For instance, doctor is sitting somewhere in, let's say, New York. And that doctor, through this transcranial helmet that he has talked about, which has already been invented, he would put it on his head and would, with the help of bionic arms, conduct a surgery in Lahore's general hospital. So this is what he calls a cy cyborg doctor. And he says, well, the technology is already there and things of this sort are already happening. So there is no reason to believe that this is not going to advance in future. So future is already here, present. Similarly, he talks about these bionic arms and he talks about hands and feet. Already, this experiment has been conducted on monkeys that through their thoughts, monkeys have learned to operate these arms which are not connected with their bodies. So it's through that element and that element reads your thoughts. That is already happening. And by the way, this is the reason why he calls it a brief history of tomorrow. Because he says that these things have already happened. So what I am doing now is that I am simply extrapolating and I am seeing that if history continues to unravel in the way it has been unraveling for the last few centuries, this is how our future would look like. And he says that if there is some grand change which is going to occur, which is unexpected, uh, like last time when Arthur Fusen talked about black swan, so if some black swan appears and certain unexpected things happen, there is a chance that the future is pretty different. But right now that is where we are heading. So he says that you can already buy a mind reading helmet online for $400, so it is already there. So since the first section is very important and he goes on to discuss various other issues in this very first section. And then he says, well, uh, he goes on and he talks about the fact that all right, we are racing towards future. And then there is one section which is uh, entitled, can someone please hit the brakes? So all his subtitles are interestingly phrased. So one subsection is, can, any, can someone hit the brakes? And then later on he says, well, nobody knows where the brakes are. And he gives examples of the stock exchange and uh, that, that the system is so complex that nobody knows where is it heading. So he says that we simply cannot, uh, that we have somehow, uh, as far as, uh, all right. So one question that he addresses is that somebody might say, or thinking ethically, some people would say, well, all right, scientific advancement is fine, but can you please not go for superhuman qualities? Let's stop human beings from becoming gods. Let's ask them not to do this. But then he says, well, both these issues are intertwined. Because once you try to fix a problem, then you realize that you've got the technology and you can get something extra. So he gives the examples of war and how certain surgeries were conducted to reconstruct a soldier's face, which was blown off, part of which was blown off in a war. So initially those surgeries or surgeons, they started thinking about the ways in which that part of the face could be reconstructed. Now once that happened, they realized, all right, we can also redo a person's nose and make it look prettier. So they started doing that as well. So he says that both these things are intertwined and it is inevitable that human beings would move towards a stage or a state where they would acquire these uh, superhuman qualities. So similarly, he gives examples from the world of genetics. 
And he says, well, you try to fix a problem which is in the genes within the embryo or within uh, when the child is in the womb of her mother. You try to fix that. Because if you don't fix that, since you have discovered or diagnosed that this problem is going to come up later in his or her life, and you try to fix that. Now, once you develop the technology, then you ask people, well, would you like us to also fix some other thing with your child? For instance, would you like your child to be a little taller so that he is somehow, uh, I don't know, a better <laughs> basketball player? So then they would say, all right, yes, how much for that? Another thousand dollars, and you do that as well. So he says that this is going to continue and already genetic engineering and then there is this term which is used uh, uh, which is called designer babies. So there is a lot of talk about designer babies these days as well. And then he goes on and he points out uh, uh, in this very interesting and profound section which is called the paradox of knowledge. And the paradox of knowledge, although I'm not going to go into uh, the detail of it here, but then here he points out this issue of the gap between the rich and the poor. So he says that it is going to augment with this technology. Now, what is going to happen in a society where you have the, the children of the rich who have this genetic advantage, while the children of the poor, they are sada human beings like us. So then what's going to happen? What will you do with, with them? So he builds these steps and he moves on and within this section, now this, uh, this is uh, the first section has already uh, started uh, and in the first section uh, which is called, the first section is called Homo sapiens conquer the world. That was the first section. Now within this section in the last part, he philosophizes lawns. For instance, he says look at lawns. Why do we want lawns in front of our homes? And why is it that lawns uh, also are symbols of status? So he briefly traces the history. And he talks about our likeness for lawns. And he connects it with history. And he says that thoughtlessly, thoughtlessly we continue with the, with, with the desire to have lawns. And he says that initially only governors, Roman governors and people who were aristocrats, only they could afford lawns. But then due to access of uh, water and lack of your reliability on extra labor to have a lawn and because of uh, invention of lawn mowers and other things, now ordinary or middle class people, they can also uh, so with this he moves on and he connects it with the fact that well everybody goes with the flow and thinks along lines that uh, along the ideas that they have inherited. Now instead we need to think a little differently and with this he moves on and he says for the last 300 years we have had the rise of humanism. So, if anybody says that this humanism is now extinct or will become extinct, the philosophical premise of humanism, this will be no longer relevant. People would question it. But then he says, look at history. Pharaohs ruled Egypt for 3,000 years. And while they were ruling or at the twilight, if somebody told them that, well, your rule is going to end, they would have never imagined it. They would have never believed it. So he says, he somehow insinuates that humanism also has, now it is its climax. So we need to think about that as well. With this, as I told you, there are three sections and one very long introduction. So with this, he moves towards part two, which is entitled Homo sapiens uh, part, this is part two, all right, again. So he moves towards this and he talks about Anthropocene that human beings have appeared on the planet, well, this is part one. I incorrectly wrote part two. This is part one. Part, the earlier part was introduction, then we have part one, and this is part one, Homo sapiens conquered the world, in which he talks about Anthropocene. Now, 
I think many of you would be familiar, this is the age in which human beings have appeared. It started 70,000 years ago, that human beings have the most dominant impact on environment. So that is called the Anthropocene, and scientists have divided human uh, uh, geography or ages uh, on the basis of these words. So he talks about this and human beings' impact on the world. And he then, what he does here is that he, when we talk about Anthropocene, Anthropo, of course, is uh, the word for human beings. It has Greek origin. Now, in this section, he does something very interesting, that he demystifies as far as human beings are concerned, and he says that this idea of a soul, it is already a myth, and what we possess are algorithms. These emotions are biochemical algorithms, and in this we are familiar with the rest of the, the animal kingdom, that they also possess these biochemical algorithms, which are emotions, and we also possess these biochemical algorithms. Now, I can simplify, for instance, he gives the recipe of making an egg. He says, well, this is an algorithm, that you take an egg, or you take two eggs, and you break them, and then you do this, and then you do that. So when you write a recipe, at the very basic level, that's an algorithm. He says that these neural networks that we have, they are pre-programmed in such a way that if you do this, this is going to be the outcome. If you do that, this is going to be the outcome. Now he says that a computer essentially works in the same way. A neural network works in the same way. And similarly, human beings work in the same way. But they have this most advanced complex algorithms inside their head. And now with greater computing power, computers are going to take over. Now human beings, later on, he goes on to add that human beings conquered the world because they had this processing capability which other animals did not have, which Neanderthals did not have. So they coordinated and one human being could be understood as a single chip. And one human being had a certain processing power. Now when they formed communities, and when they started imagining things together, what he calls fiction or what he calls stories, they were able to coordinate. They were able to share their ideas. They were able to think in a similar manner. And this computing power was combined. And that gave human beings their superiority. So I'm no longer dealing with the script because I know I just have a few minutes left. So this is the crux, and that's how he proceeds. So he explains that human beings have this dominance on the planet, and they were able to, for instance, sideline other animals and domesticate them because of this greater processing capacity which they had. And then he goes on to say, well, now with the advent of supercomputers, they've got greater processing capacity than human beings. They can compute faster and they can come up with results. And then he gives on, he goes on giving examples of Facebook and Google and the kind of big data that they have and based on this they can make accurate predictions. So he gave, gives examples of doctors for instance. And already IBM's computer Watson has been able to diagnose diseases more accurately than the best of doctors. Similarly, computer decades ago managed to beat Gary Kasparov, the champion of chess, based on the data which was fed into that system. Now he says, because now this capacity has grown colossally, this artificial intelligence or AI is going to take over. So for instance, he gives examples of uh, a symphony and he says, well, the greatest of human computers, uh, composers like Beethoven and Mozart, they've been beaten by computers who have generated symphonies and the best connoisseurs or judges of those symphonies, they were made to sit in a hall and they listen to those symphonies 
and they rated those computer symphonies over the symphonies which were from human beings, the best of composers, without knowing which were composed by which entity. So this is how this goes on, and in this discussion, in this section, he goes on to talk about it, and then he complicates the issue further, and he talks about a stock exchange, and he talks about consciousness, and he says that, well, one is intelligence, the other one is consciousness. The way he demystifies the idea of a soul, and he says that we have absolutely no scientific evidence for it, Similarly, he says that, well, consciousness, that is something subjective, and we can never know about it in detail. And science has been unable to tell us about it, that what is consciousness. So in a very humorous and in a very light-hearted manner, at one point he says that it might simply be the pollution which is created by this processing which is going on inside our minds. So with this, he differentiates between intelligence and consciousness. I'll just uh, finish in three, four minutes. I think I'm, I've already spent my time. Okay, just three, four minutes. So with this, he moves on and he talks about life and he says much of it in the sense of uh, the way he would, for instance, talk about, uh, he would raise these questions. And he moves on and he philosophizes about life. He gives examples of uh, experiments which were conducted on lab rats. That how certain, when certain parts of their brain were triggered, they felt better or they acquired a kind of a nirvana. So he says that why can't we think about something similar about human beings, that, that too, and it's also related to that biochemical uh, rigging of the system. Now with this, he moves on and he talks about the web of meaning. That's a very enduring idea which he has given. He talks about this intersubjective reality that we create, or this intersubjective web of meaning. What is it? That we believe in the same thing. So for instance, according to him, all religions are stories, all companies are stories, even money is a story because it does not have that intrinsic value now. Back in the past, gold had intrinsic value, but these dollars of this currency, it doesn't have any intrinsic value. It doesn't have any sort of precious metal in it. It is valuable because all of us believe it to be valuable. So with this, he talks about this intersubjective web of meaning and the ability to organize. I've already stated it earlier, that, that it, according to him is the edge which human beings have. And then he goes on and he talks about a lot of, uh, in detail about humanism and that how humanity replaced God. Because humanism actually replaced Godism. So God was at the center and anything which came from religious institutions that was believed in, but then later human beings were placed at the center and anything which was good for human beings or it was considered good for human beings, that was thought to be the best thing for them. And similarly he goes on and he, he tries to demystify the idea of a stable human self and says, well, we don't know whether we are individuals, rather when we focus, we feel as if we are dividend, divid, individuals, individuals. So he says that we are individuals. Because if you really focus, now in this he gives very interesting example of how he used to take tea while reading, while doing work. And then later on, he doing nothing while taking tea and only focusing on the taste of tea. That's how he honed his tea drinking skills and he was able to differentiate one tea from another and develop this rather, this taste for Chinese tea and various other teas of the world. So he says this is our fundamental problem as human beings, that we are unable to focus. Since he's also into this meditative practice and he goes to India to do this meditation and where you have to just sit and do nothing and think about your own breathing 
And whenever your consciousness or your mind goes away from your breathing, you've got to notice that, that I'm going away from breathing and I'm no longer focusing on it. So based on this, he says that, well, since we are not that sensitive and we do not think with that sort of focus, that's why we feel that we have a stable self. When we actually focus, we realize that there is cacophony of voices within us. So there are many cells within me, he says. And by doing so, he then also tries to dismantle the idea of a stable self. And with this, the final section of the book is entitled, How, uh, sorry, Homo Sapiens Lose Control. And then he talks about this emotional manipulation. I've already talked about it. And how there is this lots of data that is coming our way. He goes on to talk about the fact that now new religions, now he says that all these old religions are dead. So that famous pronouncement which came from Nietzsche, I didn't say that God is dead. So he says God is dead, we just have to get rid of the body yet. So he says that these religions in popular conceptions and of course you have to keep in mind that he is looking at it from this European perspective. He says that all these, and he calls humanism a religion as well. And then he goes on to say, well humanism was focused on the idea of a stable human being. Now, since that idea when we really focus, we don't see how this human being can be better than other organisms and doesn't have that stable self or that soul. Scientifically, that cannot be proven. So then this human has to be dismantled as well, the idea of this human being. And instead of humanism, we are moving towards a new religion, which is the last section of the book, which, is, which he calls dataism. Dataism. So he says that now we are moving towards dataism, and a lot depends on computing power. So these oracles of data, like Facebook and uh, like uh, these companies, Google, he says that from being an oracle of this new religion, they are going to become sovereigns of new religion because they will amass a lot of power. And then finally, when he ends the book, he says that, well, we need to think what sort of a world is it going to be where there will be extremely intelligent machines and lots of what we do will be taken over by machines and there will be a lot of, he writes it there, we will have a lot of superfluous human beings in the sense that their jobs will be taken over by machines and they will be doing a much better job. So this will be a question what are we going to do with those extra human beings that we will have in the world? So he ends with these three questions. And he says that we need to think about these questions. Number one, are organisms really just algorithms? And is life really just data processing? That's the first question. Number two, what is more valuable, intelligence? or consciousness. And number three, what will happen to society, politics and daily life when non-conscious but highly intelligent algorithms know us better than we know ourselves? So these are the questions that he has raised. And finally, my final comment would be <coughs> that this book gives us much food for thought. And it gives us lots of questions that we can think about, that we can critically look at, and we can see how these two paradigms, the paradigms that we have in the East, the paradigm, for instance, which Islam has to offer, it presents, a, I think, a totally different picture of what a human being is. But still, we need to articulate our point of view. He has given lots of details, lots of evidence, lots of data and we cannot say at the end of the day that we don't know what to do in the world, what to do in the world, what to do in the world, what to do in the world.
کہ ہم پڑھیں اور عقلی بنیادوں پہ جہاں تک ہو سکے ہم پوری دنیا کے انسانوں کے لیے اور خاص طور سے اپنے لیے ہم یہ سمجھے تو صحیح کہ ہمارے پاس دلائل کیا ہے تھینک یو ویری مچ